Thank you. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to today's webinar, where we are commemorating the World AIDS Day. My name is Professor Busiswe Nama. I'm the Deputy Vice Chancellor and Head of the College of Health Sciences. My role today is really to facilitate the presentations and discussions. We have our panelists who will lead us through the presentations. I would like to welcome the members of the UKZN Council, UKZN Executive, UKZN Convocation, the panelists and speakers, the Department of Health Management and the National Health Services Laboratories, the KZN offices, as well as hospital staff. I would also like to welcome staff from NHLS as well as NICD, our own alumni and our own staff from the universities, both here in South Africa and abroad, guests from government departments and all municipalities, members of the media, HIV and AIDS research centers and advocacy groups, staff and students from UKZN and our research centers, including Ari, Caprisa, Sandy and Crisp, the entire UKZN community, as well as members of the public, you are all welcome. I would like to apologize on behalf of the Vice Chancellor, Professor Nana Poku. He was meant to do the opening, but he, can, he couldn't uh, uh, be to, uh, with us today. He's had urgent business to attend to, and uh, he sends his greetings. I would also like to recognize our UK's NHIV and AIDS unit leaders, Ms. Eleanor Langley and Mr. Amit Rambali, who started with the process of organizing this webinar, as well as Mary Ann Francis, who completed the task. The World AIDS Day is a day when the world comes together to raise awareness on HIV and AIDS. It's an opportunity for us to reaffirm our solidarity with close to 38 million people living with HIV worldwide. We commit to reducing stigma and also commemorate those who have died as a result of HIV and AIDS. However, 2020 saw us face another pandemic, which is COVID-19. The theme of 2020 World AIDS Day is global solidarity, shared responsibility. The UN has issued a call for global solidarity and shared responsibility to overcome not only COVID-19, but also AIDS, another global pandemic that's still with us more than 40 years after it emerged. The program has been circulated um, as well as the power sketches. So I will read the short version in the interest of time. Without uh, wasting time, I would like to call upon Professor Mashabela, who is the Dean and Head of School, School of Nursing and Public Health, to give us our op opening remarks. Over to you, Professor Moshabel. Thank you, DVC, uh, Professor Nwama. Greetings, uh, colleagues, and uh, greetings all the attendees of the webinar. And I also like to greet the panelists. Um, uh, on this day, um, on the 1st of December, it, it's a, a moment for us to, to, to take a moment and look back and uh, basically uh, think about the journey that we have traveled over many years of um, fighting HIV AIDS and the uh, related conditions that come with it, including uh, TB, the different uh, groups of um, people who in our society who are adversely affected by HIV directly and, and indirectly. It, it is quite humbling to think that there was a time when HIV was a, a disease that was very difficult to manage and uh, many people were condemned to death because of uh, HIV. And uh, the innovations that we have gone through and the progress that we have seen over many years to, to come to this point. And uh, we have overcome so many challenges over the years and yet there's also so many challenges that we continue to face, and those challenges cannot necessarily be easily addressed. I remember in the World AIDS Day event last year uh, that we held at the medical school at UKZN, that we kept talking about this problem of uh, prevention and, and behavior change, and the fact that it's been so difficult to, to improve behavior. 
little did we know that we, we were going to have to talk so much about behavior change in the time of COVID-19. But, uh, you know, we cannot necessarily uh, be consumed completely by COVID-19 and forget uh, HIV AIDS as a problem that, you know, has been here before COVID-19 and will continue to be here um, even after COVID-19. In KwaZulu-Natal, we particularly know very well the severe impact of, uh, of HIV AIDS and TB. And, and I think that for today, you know, it will be an opportunity for us to reflect, uh, you know, on HIV AIDS in relation to COVID-19, but also think a little bit about how the two conditions are interacting. And also as we move forward, what is it that we can learn, that we can take forward as lessons to improve the care and service that we provide for people who live with HIV AIDS and related conditions. We've seen during COVID-19 that uh, it is so easy whenever we are faced with uh, a severe threat to shut down our borders, to only care about um, our nations and our communities. And uh, in the world, we've seen uh, the way people are competing for vaccines and they were competing for uh, PPE um, and so forth. And it reminded us, and even through the World Health Organization, that it's important for us to see ourselves as part of, of uh, one nation in the world and for us to hold hands. We've seen it here in South Africa the importance of working together, of collaborating to make sure that we fight the condition. We've mounted a, a very successful response in terms of COVID-19. And every time we learn this with HIV AIDS and we are seeing it with COVID-19, that we, we have to mobilize all the resources we have in our society to be able to successfully mount a response. And, and I'm just, flagging these issues in terms of this notion of solidarity. I mean, South Africa ended up with a solidarity fund. We spoke a lot about solidarity nationally, but also globally. And also in terms of behavior, we spoke quite a bit about the importance of people taking responsibility individually, but also collectively taking responsibility. When you're faced with a condition where you don't have effective therapy as we do now with COVID-19, and we have been through similar with HIV before. We, we realize how important it is to make sure that uh, as individuals and collectively, we take responsibility and we emphasize prevention measures. And uh, the theme therefore for the World AIDS Day, it's, it's appropriate for these reasons. And I, I don't necessarily want to steal the thunder from our colleagues who are going to share the wisdom with us today, but just to, say to everyone that I think that it's important for us as we engage in this discussion today to, to think carefully about what solidarity means for each and every one of us in our institution, uh, as well as in our province and in our country and globally. And also what, what role can we play each and every one of us individually, but also collectively. And, and overcome our differences to make sure that we are able to uh, mount a formidable response against this uh, pandemic and also the epidemics that we continue, we continue to face. And also make sure that we don't lose the opportunity to, to learn lessons together that we can take forward to reinforce our responses. I'd like to thank all of you for, for joining as well. And I look forward to the discussions and I encourage you to engage in the discussion and uh, thank you, uh, I'll hand over back to the DVC and thank you for the opportunity to share a few remarks, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Moshabela. Thanks for the opening remarks, which are really thought provoking. And uh, we have our panelists who are really experts in these areas. And uh, in the interest of time, we are running a bit behind schedule. I would like to call upon Professor Nombulelo Makula. She's going to talk to us uh, about the UN AIDS 1990 uh, strategy to end HIV as a public health threat, attaining these targets amidst the COVID-19 pandemic. The biosketches have been circulated, so I will read the shortened version. 
Professor Nombulelo Makula, Buli Makula, as you know her, is the head of internal medicine at UKZN. She has worked in the field of TB and HIV since qualifying as a specialist physician in 2002. Her research interests lie in the field of TB, HIV, and the intersection with non-complicable diseases. Professor Makula currently serves on the COVID-19 Ministerial Advisory Committee, known as MEC, and she chairs the Wazulu Natal Provincial Clinical Management Committee on COVID-19. She serves as key opinion leader for the Etewini Municipality for Fast Track uh, Cities for the International Association for Providers of AIDS Care in collaboration with the Joint United Nations Program on HIV AIDS working towards the attainment of the UN AIDS 1990 goal to end HIV as a public health threat. Professor Makula has also been appointed as a commissioner for the Lancet HIV EAPEP Commission on the Future of Urban HIV Responses. As I said, there is a much longer bio sketch, but uh, I've given a shortened one. Thank you very much, Professor Makula, over to you. Thank you very much, Professor Ngama, for that kind uh, introduction. Good evening, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, and all protocols observed. In the next few minutes, I'm going to, um, trying to move my slide. In the next few minutes, I'm going to go through a historical perspective um, on the UN AIDS 1990 uh, goal setting, as well as where we are now. And I also talk about uh, what we need to be doing beyond the numbers and why we have to get the numbers right. Uh, back in 2013, the UN AIDS set up a roadmap of getting the world to end the HIV AIDS uh, epidemic. And uh, on this day in 2014, a Paris declaration was signed by mayors uh, from cities of the world where they committed to this uh, target of ending HIV um, as a public health threat. And this meant that um, there would be commitment to uh, get 90% of people that are living with HIV knowing their status and of those getting them to be on, on treatment and of those that are on treatment achieving uh, a, a viral suppression in 90% of those that are receiving treatment. A multi-level political, public health and community representatives committed on this World's Day in, on, on, this, on the World AIDS Day in 2014 to a more wide ranging set of objectives aimed at assisting cities and municipalities to meet these benchmarks and also facilitating a social transformation. This picture here shows uh, those mayors that met and signed the Paris Declaration and you're seeing the signatures and amongst these signatures we do have a signature from uh, Durban, from the city of Durban and uh, this was committing to fast tracking cities uh, to ending HIV as a public health threat. So the declaration was subsequently adopted uh, by the General Assembly, the UN Political Declaration on, A on Ending AIDS in the year 2016. So this commitment uh, speaks to those people that are estimated to be living with HIV, uh, having 90% of them actually knowing their HIV status and then putting them onto treatment and then attaining viral suppression. A set of objectives was then uh, agreed upon between the UN AIDS as well as the International Association of Providers of AIDS Care and um, the cities are supported 
through this collaboration between the UN AIDS as well as IPEC to achieve these uh, objectives of optimizing HIV service delivery, coordinating data collection, developing CT dashboard, building clinician and community capacity to facilitate a, a service optimization, conducting stigma elimination education, education for clinicians. Um, and so in Eteguini, we have our mayor that is leading the Fast Track Cities initiative. And if you visit the Fast Track Cities website uh, for Eteguini municipality, you will learn more about what is happening in Eteguini in response to the HIV epidemic driven through the, uh, supported largely through the, the Fast Track Cities initiative and other efforts in the city and this is happening in other cities as well. The second city that is supported through this initiative in South Africa is Johannesburg. This slide shows what has happened between 2015 excuse me, 2010 and 2019, and we're seeing a reduction uh, in the total population of 57% uh, with respect to incidents in HIV infection. And we're seeing that incidence also uh, being reduced also amongst the adolescent and youth aged 15 to 24. I'd like to draw your attention to the third column in the slide where um, children, so you're seeing a lot of 90s in this table, but if you look closer to the children population, then you're finding that only 79% of children know their HIV status. And of those that know their HIV status, 68% of children are on treatment. And uh, so this is a serious concern. Um, I'm bringing your attention to KwaZulu Natal, but even at national level, the numbers don't seem to be any much different. This slide shows what is happening with the uh, prevalence of HIV uh, data as at March 2020. Uh, the, the pink bars are cities in Gauteng, the first one being Johannesburg, the brown bar being uh, cities in KwaZulu-Natal, with the second bar, uh, Eteguini, represented. The brown bars, again, are showing what's happening with respect to treatment amongst people older than age of, the age of 15, as at March 2020, uh, below 80%. And uh, you can see that in Johannesburg, in the cities of Johannesburg, even lower than that. Uh, this uh, shows um, new infections uh, as at March 2020. And uh, the first three bars are cities in Johannesburg, Eguruleni, uh, Eteguini, representing the first three. Now, beneath all of this HIV data is a disturbing phenomenon that uh, we are seeing with gender-based violence. And this data shows sexual assault um, amongst children and uh, amongst adults as well as, uh, as, well as children, uh, where we see that uh, in, in the purple color, there's a, a, a children that are sexually assaulted. Um, so the London Fast Track Cities uh, Initiative hosted the inaugural conference um, in London looking beyond the numbers, looking at uh, the, the epidemics of HIV, TB, as well as viral hepatitis and uh, how cities need to be supported to achieve these targets by the year 2030 so that we could see the end of uh, these epidemics by the year 2030, placing people at the center of the HIV, TB and viral hepatitis responses, addressing the causes of risk, vulnerability, transmission of HIV, TB, and viral hepatitis, and then using these HIV, TB, and viral hepatitis responses for a positive social transformation. So beyond these numbers, what should we be thinking of and why are the numbers so important? Why is it so important that we get the numbers right? One of our registrars, Dr. Sarusha Pile, registrar in internal medicine, presented her research out of one of the community health centers in KwaZulu-Natal, 
where she showed that amongst patients that are presenting with the, the simplest form to treat of tuberculosis, which is pulmonary tuberculosis, our success rate using the WHO and the International Union Against TB and Lung Disease criteria, only one in two patients actually were successfully treated uh, for tuberculosis. A couple of years before this, uh, for his master's degree, Dr. Vassen Gounden showed that within a space of three months in a tertiary facility of those that were presenting with tuberculosis, 43% of them had extra pulmonary tuberculosis. This is a more complicated tuberculosis that's presenting in lymph nodes, the bone, the abdomen, the bone marrow, very difficult to treat tuberculosis. And of these patients, 88% of them had HIV infection, they were antiretroviral treatment naive with a median CD4 cell count of 68. Um, disturbing also is the fact that 96% of these individuals were Black African and 71% of them were unemployed. Um, Dr. Vumim Banjo showed in her master's research that of those that are presenting uh, with liver disease in the HIV, um, while the largest majority are presenting with heart failure, in, in, in other p p problems that are being seen in these patients are tuberculosis, drug-induced liver injury, as well as acute hepatitis. Dr. Manimani also showed a similar trend that patients that are admitted are arriving in facilities with CD4 counts less than uh, 200 for 48% of them with CD4 counts less than 200, and uh, they are complicating with tuberculosis, kidney disease, and they're dying from these diseases. And so this highlights the importance of getting the numbers right. And the reason we have to get the numbers right is so that we can reduce mortality and also reduce the transmission of HIV. The UNAIDS has adopted the U equals U strategy where we, there is promotion of understanding that once people achieve undetectable virus, viral uh, suppression, then they cannot transmit infection. In the spirit of solidarity um, that Professor Mushabela has shared with us, Cities across Africa met in Kigali, Rwanda to share best practices and, uh, and, and also learn from one another in terms of how we should be responding as a continent to the HIV epidemic. Then came along the, HIV, the SARS coronavirus uh, epidemic, pandemic. Um, then we have seen what it has done to our society and we have learned how we need to be protecting ourselves from this infection. But when all those measures fail and we do get infected and we happen to be living with HIV and tuberculosis, the disease gets even more complicated. Uh, Dr. Soma Pillay led the management of this patient who presented with HIV infection that was diagnosed in 1997, however, defaulted her treatment, thinking that she did not have to continue with HIV treatment. Her CD4 count was 66 and her viral load was very high. She was treated for uh, COVID uh, pneumonia, having tested positive for COVID-19, and she was also treated for other opportunistic infections like PCP, PJP pneumonia, and she also tested positive for tuberculosis. And while she was uh, receiving all optimal care, she continued to be symptomatic uh, with respiratory symptoms. Her CT scan on the right confirmed that she had a pulmonary embolus, which is a complication related to COVID-19, but it could also be related to any of the other infections that, that were coexisting in this patient. And so the treatment became complicated, but treat, the patient was successfully treated. Underlying difficulties in completing treatment are the issues of stigma, where 
individuals that are living with HIV feel stigmatized. Uh, this survey shows that 30% of people living with HIV feel a community stigma and 20% uh, of them experience stigma in facilities. What are the drivers? It's the lack of awareness, moral judgment, a fear and ignorance. And some patients would actually choose a path that leads to death rather than take a single pill because of the stigma they experience. So what do we need to be doing? We need to be focusing on behavior. We need to be finding strategies of stemming this behavior that results in older men engaging in sexual activity with children. We need to enhance um, awareness around the uh, voluntary uh, medical male uh, circumcision, the use of condoms, and all strategies that are related to prevention. We need to deal with stigma, normalize living with HIV and treating HIV. We need to find those children uh, through their grandmothers, their teachers, pastors, and, show, and ensure that children understand very early and that they are counseled. We need to work together because we are all in this together. We can stop transmission of HIV so that by the year 2030, we can live a life or our children and their children can live a life that is free of the HIV TB epidemic. We need to promote HIV testing. We need to promote condom distribution. We need to reach key population. We need to um, raise awareness around pre-exposure prophylaxis, post-exposure prophylaxis, enhance testing, uptake of treatment, adherence, viral suppression. As we do all of this, we need, we are reminded by our MEC of education of the importance of the ABC that was there before treatment came along abstinence, being faithful, and then condomizing. Uh, we are also conscientized about uh, the, the, the sketch of what in the community is called Bluetooth, where young people abuse drugs and they then uh, transfer um, drug-filled blood from one person to the next so that they enjoy the high of drugs. We need to prioritize strategies of stemming these uh, problems. Uh, UKZN um, had an initiative to raise awareness around 1990-90 and had a campus to campus race uh, you know, to, to raise awareness around this and yours truly really is in there somewhere in the crowd running uh, to raise awareness about 1990. Our strategy really lies in the community. Our response has to be led from the community, by community leaders, all of us working together, people living with HIV, academia, government departments, traditional leaders, faith-based leaders, everybody, we all need to be young people, we need to be working together. As I close, I'd, I'd like to just read this uh, quote from Maya Angelou, which says, if it is true that a, ch a, a chain is only as strong as its weakest link, isn't it also true that society is only as healthy as its sickest citizen and only as wealthy as its most deprived? And this one, from uh, Howard Hendricks, which says, you teach what you know, but you reproduce what you are. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Well, thank you very much, Professor Makula. I, we would give you a round of applause, but I don't think you can hear it. We are really heartened by the presentation. And thank you for sharing your knowledge with us on this important subject. We've noted that it's very heartening to learn about the commitment of cities through their mayors towards ending the pandemic by the year 2030. The concern around children and HIV AIDS, it's also noted. You've highlighted that they don't, a, num a significant number do not know their status and they even more are not accessing treatment. We also noted the sexual assault that is equally worrying among children and you've talked a lot about uh, as well stigma and behavioral interventions that can help us stop the transmission of HIV AIDS. With this, I think it's befitting that uh, Professor Andladlam Kize is the next speaker because she can, he can share with us uh, a bit around uh, such interventions 
especially the behavioral interventions. But uh, his topic today is on psychosocial implications of COVID-19 on people living with HIV. Just as a housekeeping uh, 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 announcement, we thank all colleagues that have joined this afternoon. And if you have any questions for the panel uh, so that they can address the questions, just post them on the question and answer button on the bottom of your screen. If you go down to your screen and on the bottom of your screen, you'll see a, a button that uh, says Q&A. Reserve the chat, uh, the chat icon for general chat only. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Ntlantlam Kise. Over to you. Listen, uh, please bear with me. I'm trying to share my screen with you. Uh, okay. Let's see if I can succeed. Yeah. Can you see anything on the screen? Yes, Prof, we can. Okay. Okay, uh, thank you again, uh, colleagues. I'm going to be talking a little bit on the psychosocial. Prof, yes. Prof, have you opened your, 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 your presentation? Yes, uh, it, it says the uh, sharing is paused. Uh, resume, sh resume share. Because we are seeing a, 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 a screen, a different screen. It looks like it's your, your, your number of PowerPoint presentation. Yeah, there you have it now. Thanks. Thank you. You can see it now. Yes, very well now. Thanks, Prof. You can just put it on slideshow. Go to the bottom there, bottom of your, and there's a slideshow button. Okay. Our concern, uh, uh, in the communities, not only in South Africa and Africa, but worldwide. And we are seeing an increase uh, in disorders such as depression, as well as common disorders in the population. And we anticipate that uh, these are going to be exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic as people lose employment, as people are quarantined, and this is more so given that the ratio of the psychiatrists or psychologists to the general population in South Africa and generally in Africa as a whole is very, very high. So we need to bear this in mind as I take you through this presentation. But I also do want to highlight that uh, the issues that are emerging in communities are, are really, really troubling where you find in primary schools uh, um, sexually active children who are being uh, violated by, by older men. So these are issues that will need urgent attention because access to resources because of COVID-19 is going to exacerbate them. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, generally uh, the impact of COVID-19 on the population is a uh, is, is quite complex and there are so many factors that will uh, intersect. First and foremost, as I've already indicated, we have the financial stressors uh, because people are losing their jobs or their jobs are becoming insecure. We know for a fact that some people have committed suicide or some families have been broken uh, because of the financial implications of COVID-19 and uh, many, many people are living on reduced income and this is having a major, major impact on the community. Uh, we do know that uh, in as much as new vaccines are, are now emerging at this point in time, at least uh, 
uh, we do not have a vaccine to offer as yet. There are many, many uh, uh, vaccines that are emerging and we hope that they will be available to the South African population as soon as possible next year. There is also a threat to health uh, because of COVID-19, uh, observing somebody dying because of COVID-19 and managing the uh, psychological resources that are associated with that is also a complex stressor. And so is social isolation and loneliness arising from the uh, physical distancing measures that we are recommending. So uh, COVID-19 impacts on a population in a number of ways, but unfortunately the resources that are devoted to the management of uh, mental health are limited. And I would appeal to all of us to lobby government to devote more resources to the management of uh, mental health uh, in the population, include both the severe mental disorders as well as the common mental disorders. Okay. Uh, okay, generally, uh, when we are talking about uh, interventions, uh, especially in the psychological literature, we normally want to embed them in an ecological systems framework, because we understand that any intervention in one level of the system uh, will have replications on all levels of the system. Now, I'm not going to talk extensively to the diagram that you see in front of you. I may highlight some of the areas that may be of concern to us, especially as we look at COVID-19, people living with HIV and AIDS, and more importantly, the elderly. Uh, you will notice here that we highlight the individual, and under the individual, we have got a number of variables such as uh, sex, age, health, etc. And we do know that uh, people uh, living with HIV and AIDS, especially if they are the elderly, they will be more vulnerable to social isolation as you remove their peers who are surrounding them. And also as you remove the church group, which uh, acts as a major, major uh, resource or form of social support for them. So these uh, factors act together to add a disproportionate burden of mental health to people living with HIV and AIDS whose social surroundings have already been limited because of the stigmatization associated with HIV. I do also want to maybe uh, mention the time dimension, the socio historical conditions and time since life events, as you will be aware, people living with HIV and AIDS would have experienced discriminations in the past. They would have experienced social isolation in the past. And it is possible that as a result of COVID-19, they will uh, recall this again and PTD, PSTD will come to the fore. So this is generally the model that we use to understand how the whole system impacts on the mental health and well-being of the individual. And we argue that for people living with HIV and AIDS, especially if they are the elderly and they are being forced to live in, in social isolation away from the uh, children and grandchildren who are their primary sources of social support, away from their church group, uh, they become even more vulnerable to mental disorders let alone the victimization that we are seeing in our communities. Uh, this is a model that we normally use uh, in crisis interventions. And uh, I'm not going to focus more uh, or, uh, too much on this model, save to mention that where it comes to the community and the mental health disorders, we want to pay more attention towards the strengthening of the community resources, uh, the strengthening of organizations that are already working with communities, because those uh, organizations, the NGOs, already have established their high degree of trust and issues of confidentiality may be minimized because they already have a long history of working with those organizations. So we are arguing that we need to be strengthening uh, 
the base of the pyramid in as much as there are cases where we will need specialized interventions at the tertiary level, but a, a distributed model of, of, of intervention focusing on communities and organizations that are already working with people affected by HIV and AIDS is much more likely to be successful. And this is the model that we are experimenting with uh, uh, within the University of KwaZulu-Natal, whereby we have reached out to various communities and established partnerships with them to look into how we can intervene, especially in cases where people will not readily come out because of fear of stigmatization. So what are some then of the psychosocial uh, factors uh, associated uh, with COVID-19 and living with uh, HIV and AIDS? Uh, there are many, many factors that we can uh, think about here. And I am just going to give a synopsis of these factors. First and foremost, we must never, never undermine the threat of unwanted exposure. Because as you know, people living with HIV and AIDS first face the threat of unwanted exposure. For example, they need to go and collect their uh, medication. Now, uh, with the shutdown of many of the uh, organizations and health facilities where they were collecting their medication, they will have to start looking at alternatives, uh, even uh, mechanisms such as uh, telecounseling or teletherapy exposes them to their families and partners and they may even be more vulnerable to what uh, we call interpartner violence. So there is the possibility here that the confidentiality, which is so important to, uh, uh, to, to treatment and adherence to treatment may be compromised. Uh, COVID-19 also brings about a number of uh, inequalities that are disproportionately uh, becoming the burden of women living with HIV and AIDS. Uh, for example, uh, there are so many intersecting inequalities such as uh, interpartner violence, as I've already indicated, uh, food insecurity. Many people living with HIV and AIDS, especially in informal settlements, do not have long-term full-time employment. They rely on uh, uh, part-time uh, or fixed-term uh, uh, employment or seasonal employment, and they are most likely then to be the ones who are going to lose the uh, income as a result of COVID-19. Uh, the issue of unstable housing uh, uh, and uh, as a result of uh, unstable housing, it may not be possible for them, for example, to access telecounseling. So the stay at home campaign affects them disproportionately and exposes them to a number of uh, factors, including uh, interpartner violence. So there are a number of psychological consequences that can go hand in hand with these, such as, for example, stress, uh, which may be uh, exacerbated by a uh, lack of access to uh, parks or outdoor spaces where they live, where they can walk around and relieve uh, stress, lack of access to information and technology. And again, if you are saying you are going to do social distancing, you are removing the social support and leaving them vulnerable to social isolation and loneliness and as a result, their resilience is being compromised all the time. Uh, I have spoken to the issue of disconnection and social isolation. Uh, uh, mechanisms such as uh, quarantine uh, have been shown to be uh, associated with uh, depression and stress. We have seen this emerging from the literature from the very, very beginning of the pandemic. Uh, so while these mechanisms or measures are necessary, they may have a negative impact on the population and more so on people living with HIV and AIDS. And uh, they may result in what we call disconnectedness, which is the reduced level of engagement with peers, as well as social isolation, which is the subjective feeling of social disconnectedness. So being cut from one social support networks may lead to anxiety and depression. Even with uh, the interventions that we are implementing with COVID-19, these are some of the issues that are emerging because people are going to weigh the pros and cons 
uh, of uh, social distancing and isolation. And if the psychosocial and emotional factors are more important to them at that point in time, then they will not adhere to the safety measures. So uh, this is, exp uh, and this is more so for uh, people who are more vulnerable to social isolation. And I really want to emphasize here the, the elderly and the elderly living with HIV and AIDS. Uh, uh, food insecurity, uh, many uh, people living with HIV and AIDS, especially in South Africa, as I've already indicated, are vulnerable to food uh, insecurity. And this is something that we need to pay attention to uh, because uh, there is always this issue that if we are intervening, we must intervene at the base of a, a, the so-called Maslow's hierarchy. There is no point in attending to people's mental status if uh, some of these basic and physiological needs have not been catered for. So this is something important for, for government and all of us to take into consideration. The community-based organizations, uh, which are the sources of social support for people living with HIV and AIDS, have also been forced to reduce their community-based support systems. And as a result, people living with HIV and AIDS may also now have to use teletherapy if they have access to those means and text-based counseling if they have got access to uh, airtime and the appropriate devices. But again, this leaves them vulnerable because the, the partner in the context of a two-roomed house can easily overhear the conversation or they can uh, grab the uh, cell phone and read the messages that are taking place. So there are those uh, structural con constraints that are important to bear in mind. Uh, I think this is a... a I may have gone through this. Yes, covered. I covered this, so let me go down again. So uh, then there's the issue of uh, comorbidities. Again, I want really, uh, today I'm really going to hone on, on the issue of how we look at people living with HIV and AIDS, especially if they are the elderly, because they are the ones who will uh, present with multiple uh, comorbidities uh, uh, in relation to the COVID-19 and the reduction in social activities for this particular group of people is more than likely than in any other group to lead to loneliness and social isolation. So I really want to make a strong recommendation that we need to put in place uh, psychosocial support and mechanisms to address the elderly population, who will also present, by the way, with the, uh, diminished neurocognitive functions and the, uh, as a result of their age and the, a heightened mental health burden uh, in older people living with a, a HIV AIDS may, as a result, impede self-care. Uh, uh, impede self-care and also impact on their dignity as human beings. So uh, hence the need to pay particular attention to this particular group. In the South African context, this is complicated by the fact that the burden of looking for other people is disproportionately borne by them. We know that in our communities, the grandmothers, the grandfathers are the ones who are raising kids. And uh, it leaves them vulnerable in a number of uh, uh, fronts and uh, hence the importance of paying particular attention for their mental health and well-being. So what are some of the uh, recommendations that we can think about? I think they were more than adequately covered in, the, uh, in my colleagues' uh, previous presentation, but we do have to look into the mechanisms to improve uh, food security. We do need to look at uh, improving uh, mechanisms to add ad adherence maybe by establishment of treatment support centers in the community and uh, where people living with HIV and AIDS have trusted confidantes who can uh, support adherence to treatment because this again is going to be an issue uh, uh, resulting from the shutdown. We need to strengthen community-based psychosocial support programs using community-based organizations, uh, as I've already indicated, and where it is feasible, 
uh, we need to fund digital health interventions in communities because it is easy to be talking about digital health interventions, but the majority of uh, uh, our people in the population do not have access to these. And finally, we really need to look seriously on the number of health professionals uh, that are available to support this group and, uh, and look into the training of more mental health professionals to provide support as COVID-19 has aptly demonstrated the importance of health and mental well-being as we fight the pandemic. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. I'm going to stop here for today. Thank you very much, Prof. Mkise. I now notice I did not read your, your bio sketch. No, uh, Prof. Don't worry about it. <laughs> don't worry about uh, no, it. Sorry about that, uh, but it is written, and uh, if you uh, 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 can go and read it. But basically, Prof. Mkise is a Deputy Vice Chancellor and Head of the College of Humanities. He's an expert on African psychology and ethics with reference to African philosophical underpinnings to ethics. And uh, he also interfaces between health, culture, and illness. So I will leave it there. You can read the rest of it uh, in, in, in the bio sketches that are attached. Thank you so much, for, Prof, for sharing uh, the mental health issues that are faced by our people during these uh, pandemics especially the stressors that are associated with the pandemics. We've learned a lot about the vulnerability of elderly during the, 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 the pandemic. And uh, we are very grateful for your recommendation of uh, funding digital health interventions such as teletherapy, text-based counseling. And we've also noted that food security is a big issue as you have alluded that um, in terms of the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you've got to take care of the basic needs. Thank you very much, Prof. And um, as a housekeeping issue, uh, presentations will be shared. Uh, questions, if you ask questions, they are being answered. Thanks, Prof. Makula. I see you've responded to quite a few. And we will have an opportunity at the end for a discussion. We will note hands that are raised and any questions that have not been answered by then, we'll deal with them then. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, the next speaker that we have is Professor Abdul Karim. Um, Professor Kuresh Abdul Karim. Uh, the, she will be speaking to us on the impact of COVID-19 on HIV research and advocacy work. Professor Kuresh doesn't need any introduction. She's well known in, this, in the world of uh, epidemics, especially the HIV and AIDS and the work that she has done. But I will just give a, a shortened version of a, of a bio sketch. Professor Kuresh Abdul Karim is an NRF A1 rated scientist, infectious disease epidemiologist, and associate director, scientific director of CAPRISA. She's professor in clinical epidemiology, Columbia University, New York, and also the Pro Vice Chancellor for African Health at our University of KwaZulu Natal. She is a UNAIDS Special Ambassador for Adolescents and HIV and co-chairs the UNAIDS Advisory Group to the Executive Director. Her research spans 32 years and has focused on involving HIV epidemic, on the evolving HIV epidemic and HIV infection in young women. She has received a, a number of prestigious national and international awards. She's a member of the UNH 2025 Target Setting and Resource Mobilization Steering Committee, Alliance for Sexual and Reproductive Health. I won't be able to count all, all the things that she does, but um, we are very proud to be associated with her. We really are fortunate to have her in our midst. And uh, Prof. Kuresha, uh, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. Nkama, for that uh, very warm introduction. And uh, I'm just waiting to have access to screen share and uh, to get started. So while I'm waiting, um, good evening, everyone. Uh, and um, I want to thank the organizers for the opportunity to address you uh, today on the impact of COVID-19 on HIV research and advocacy. Um, Kurt, I wonder whether you can give me access to screen share.
Prof, that should be active at the bottom of your screen. Uh, it's actually not. That's what I'm waiting for. Okay, thanks. I think we now um, probably... Is that fine? Yes, Prof, we can see it now. Please okay. Okay, so thanks again for the opportunity to address you on the impact of COVID-19 on HIV research and advocacy. And I want to thank the previous speakers also for laying some important groundwork that allows me to go through this presentation uh, fairly rapidly. Uh, so I'm going to cover three things. I want to give you a very quick update on HIV. I'm going to talk about HIV and COVID-19 particularly the little bit that we know about its impact on HIV and TB, and uh, really focus a lot more on the lessons that we've learned from HIV for our responses to COVID-19. And then I'm going to elaborate a little bit on what Schlanschla focused on, which is the intersectionality of multiple pandemics and the importance of our interdependence. So if you have to look at the global HIV epidemic at a quick glance, in 2019 worldwide, there were 38 million people living with HIV. We had nearly 700,000 deaths. And the really important number here is the 1.7 million new infections. And we have to think about that in relation to the 2020 targets of 500,000 infections. So you can see we're just over three times more than the target that was set for ending AIDS as a public health threat in 2030. So this 1.7 million new infections translates roughly to just over four and a half thousand new infections that are occurring each day. And what's significant in that is that Africa still remains home to about 70% of all infections taking place globally, both new and those with established infection. And also Sub-Saharan Africa uh, has um, a particular unique feature, which is an age sex disparate um, uh, driver of new infections. And young women who comprise about 10% of the population uh, bear the brunt of one in four new HIV infections. And this data from one of the worst um, affected districts uh, in, um, in South Africa, which has less than 1% of the population, but about one in five infections globally. And within South Africa, what we know is that the province of KwaZulu-Natal bears a, a heavy burden where seven of the 11 districts um, have the highest uh, rates of infection and amongst pregnant women, more than 40% of them are infected. So this is data from a population-based survey that tells us even with more recent data that we continue to see young women acquiring HIV infection about five to seven years younger, earlier than men, and in fact have about six times more infection between the ages of 15 to 24 compared to their male peers. But while we see um, that by age uh, 25, about every other woman is infected with HIV and by age 30, about 70% of them infected, men where we see young men uh, acquiring infection do a very rapid catch up and by age 35, uh, having a very similar picture to women at about age uh, 25, where every other male is infected. So this epidemic uh, needs us to respond in a way that uh, we address the disparities that exist and, uh, and that our response uh, requires both treatment and prevention and that preventing HIV infection in young women is critical if we're going to turn the tide on this pandemic. But equally important it is to, for men to test and be initiated on treatment. 
And I have to say that um, one of the princes from the royal Zulu family, having seen this data, initiated a very important project in KwaZulu Natal called Isibaya Samadota, that encouraged young men 25 to 35 to test for those who test positive to be initiated on treatment and for those on treatment to be supported to be virally suppressed. What was important in the population level assessment in this community was that uh, this had an impact in reducing HIV infection in young women 19 to 20 by about 40%. But what was also important was that a third of the young men who tested positive had very high viral loads suggesting recent infection. And if we just do testing with antibodies, we'll be missing all these new infections. And that's really what continues to drive infections in young women under 25. Now, even in the midst of COVID-19, I wanted to share with you that we've had some new um, data and uh, particularly some of the biomedical findings uh, is the broadly neutralizing antibodies and its potential protective benefit. Importantly, how will that help us with our vaccine uh, development initiatives? But we've also seen um, how injectable antiretrovirals used by uninfected people, uh, and particularly the cabrotegiva uh, two monthly injection uh, was able to reduce infection in women in Africa uh, by over 95%. There are a number of new trials that have been initiated. So we've gone from, for women particularly, uh, bearing the brunt of the epidemic and yet a disconnect in terms of prevention technologies uh, that they can initiate, initiate without male cooperation uh, to really quite an expansive um, array of options, at least in the, um, in, in the clinical trial proof of concept stage. So we do have now available Truvada, a daily tablet taken by uninfected people who are at risk of getting infected um, uh, to prevent HIV infection. Um, there is a challenge for some people uh, in terms of daily adherence. So these other uh, forms of delivery, long acting, slow release, um, ARVs and broadly neutralizing antibodies that range from, uh, from things that can be used uh, once a month, like Islatravir entering new trials, uh, to the two monthly injections, or even a new trial called Lencapover that could be given twice a year and could prevent infection. So the red ones, uh, re the, 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 the uh, interventions in red tell us where results were released in the past six months. And the, uh, most of the others are things that are still um, in clinical trials and uh, where we can hope to see this expansion, uh, both for men and women. But importantly, the biomedical interventions are only the first step in terms of preventing infection um, and saving lives. Um, but we shouldn't forget, as uh, Prof. Mkisi reminded us, that underlying um, uh, major issues such as structural drivers, gender inequities, gender-based violence, um, and the importance of poverty in terms of who continues to uh, get infected and our inability to turn that number that was set at 500,000 uh, to, to get to it. So in, in order to do that, these biomedical technologies can be a first step. They're not an answer in itself. And what we also know is that uh, treatment uh, is, a, um, is also a form of prevention because those who are virally suppressed uh, don't, uh, don't continue spread. But we have achieved a lot and what we have been able to achieve is reaching those who utilize health services. But we have to ask ourselves, who are we leaving behind? And I think in our HIV response, it's not about what we need to do, but it's about how we need to do that. And if we don't take these structural drivers into account, 
the gender inequity issues, the intertwining of gender-based violence as the most severe form of gender inequities that are driving it in poverty, we will continue to see the numbers that um, I've just shared for 2019. So moving on to HIV and COVID-19, we do not have a lot of data. And uh, uh, what I wanted to start with is just to share this figure that has the data on HIV on the left. And this is just the HIV data in 2019. And we look for about the same, uh, and we look at the data from COVID-19, which is a fairly new virus uh, that's come into our communities. And you can see in a matter of 12 months, so more like 11 months, uh, since we've been able to test and identify individuals who are infected, 63 million cases, and the deaths are um, about twice that that we're seeing for HIV. So COVID-19 is very, a very serious pandemic uh, facing the world, but uh, HIV and TB and malaria and a bunch of other pandemics also continue. And so our responses, while for the next minute or two, I'll focus on COVID-19, I shall return soon to remind us of other wars that face our communities and are devastating and that tend to be a little bit more silent. So when we started to see the first cases of COVID-19, I think the uncertainty, the poor lack of knowledge, um, and uh, and the limited amount of information we had. Uh, and yet what we also saw at the same time was the face of COVID-19 in countries like Italy, the UK and, uh, and New York. And what we were seeing was deaths and large numbers of people uh, dying. Rightly, the country focused on trying to prepare and respond to the epidemic to slow the spread of the virus. And I think some essential health services took a bit of a backseat. I think in terms of HIV, multi-month uh, uh, dispensing uh, was a bit of a protection for individuals uh, who were on treatment and to ensure that their treatment was not uh, interrupted. Uh, and I think um, that within uh, a short period of the, um, of the national lockdown for COVID-19, uh, there was also fear amongst patients in terms of seeking healthcare in case they acquired COVID-19. So there was a bit of push and pull in terms of um, access to uh, TB and HIV services. But uh, quoting from this publication from Shabir Mahdi, during the level five lockdown, what we saw was a 22% reduction in average weekly HIV viral load testing and a 33% reduction in CD4 cell count testing compared to the pre-lockdown periods. Now, when we first heard about the COVID epidemic, we were really concerned about what its impact was going to be in Africa, given the high burden of HIV, TB and malaria and other comorbidities. And uh, this data from Cape Town suggests that there's been no difference in outcome based on viral suppression. There's been minimal impact on HIV on COVID-19 deaths, uh, certainly in the Western Cape and other parts of the country. And uh, we've only been able to attribute about 8% of COVID-19 deaths uh, to HIV. And this could um, be attributed to the fact that COVID-19 has its highest impact on older populations and populations with comorbidities. Our HIV epidemic largely impacts younger people. And so uh, it could be a matter of time but for now, um, this is what we are seeing. I'm going to shift now to looking at our response to the epidemic and what are some of the lessons that we've learned. And a quick reminder about how important uh, scientific evidence has uh, become in terms of responses to COVID-19. And even uh, while I say this, I should add that uh, our, our knowledge um, of COVID-19 
is very limited. Um, and while we are seeing an unprecedented generation of new knowledge, there are still major gaps that remain. And the our science in the time of uh, pandemics and epidemics and disasters take on a very different meaning in terms of science during normal times. And, you know, when we have a, the luxury of time, we can replicate our studies, we can look at the data in all kinds of ways, we have time to debate and deliberate in the context of uh, an emergency disaster or a pandemic, we need to act and in some instances make some leaps of faith in terms of what available knowledge is there in the interest of saving lives. And uh, I think we've learned some good things in our responses to the epidemic as scientists and as practitioners, but we've also learned some not so good things. And I think the recent uh, sharing of our vac the vaccine uh, trial results, um, while on the one hand, it gives us great optimism, on the other hand, the kind of vaccine nationalism that we see in very inward thinking in industrialized countries uh, is very concerning. And I think we saw that earlier in the epidemic of COVID-19 or pandemic of COVID-19, where Africa was uh, at the low end in terms of uh, PPE, in terms of experiencing shortage of reagents, et cetera. So I'm going to just uh, touch on a few lessons that we've learned from HIV that has been applied to COVID-19. And I think the first is about know your epidemic and know your response. And these heat maps from the Western Cape uh, showing COVID-19 hotspots um, really illustrate uh, this important lesson that's uh, in terms of knowing where the spread is taking place and where to prioritize resources and interventions. Um, like HIV, having the tools uh, uh, has, enables us to mount a response. And even though for both HIV and for COVID-19, we don't have a vaccine uh, or a cure, uh, the importance of non-pharmaceutical interventions were highlighted. And uh, in addition, we know the importance of mask wearing. Um, but um, what is also in a very transformative in terms of tools is testing strategies. And in HIV, uh, some of us who've been around for over three decades trying to uh, enhance our response to the HIV pandemic, uh, no, it used to take two weeks when we were dependent on Western blot. And it wasn't until rapid point of care tests for HIV became available that we've been able to respond very, very rapidly to this uh, pandemic. And we're starting to this, see the same with COVID-19. Challenge of behavior change. We know that knowledge is not sufficient, but so counterproductive are scare tactics. And Shan just covered this in terms of how do we support behavior change and particularly addressing the issues of stigma and discrimination. We've learned over and over again in HIV, the critical importance of community engagements and the importance of doing things with people, not on people, and the importance of inclusion. And Shlansha, we know, is part of the new MAC that um, uh, Minister Nkisi launched, uh, recognizing the importance of community engagement, support, and partnerships for behavior change. The one area in HIV that we've not made huge progress on is addressing gender inequities and that in COVID we're seeing this again and I think several of the speakers and in the introductory comments Dr. Um, Mosa, uh, Prof, uh, uh, Mosa uh, mentioned the issue of the disproportionate impact on women and as we think about um, HIV and gender-based violence and we think about uh, COVID-19, uh, women by and large are our first responders, uh, whether it comes to delivering healthcare, education, 
or being there um, at the front end of uh, supermarkets, etc. And yet they're the first to lose jobs and most of their contribution remain unrecognized. So hoping that as we move forward, some of these gender inequity issues uh, get addressed um, as we strengthen our responses to COVID and better prepare for the many pandemics and epidemics that face us. As we think about universal health care, here's another opportunity and we can see how race and gender uh, play in terms of, uh, of who's dying uh, of this pandemic. But we've also seen how things like the Global Fund, government investments, um, the uh, US uh, Presidential Emergency Program for AIDS Relief has also shown us the importance of global solidarity, leadership and partnerships can change the course of history. And we're starting to see that uh, with COVID and we hope that continues. And um, as I mentioned earlier, there are many uh, pandemics that face us and these the ones that we can see and measure gets our attention. Those that we can't see, but we know about um, and don't measure things like mental health and substance use are things that have been around, have been growing. Communicable and non-communicable diseases converging uh, and becoming more um, visible with COVID-19, but also the common structural drivers and need for people-centered approaches. And I wanted to end with this quote from Pope Francis on COVID-19. This is a moment to dream big, to rethink our priorities, what we value, what we want, what we seek, and to commit to act in our daily life on what we have dreamed of. And I think we can take this and apply it to many of the challenges facing us. And that in facing challenges, what we have to appreciate is that where humankind has to act, uh, precisely there in the threat in itself is where the door opens. So thank you very much for this opportunity and for your attention. Thank you very much, Prof. Kuresha. Uh, Thanks so much for the uh, interesting presentation. Thanks for sharing with us the work that you've been doing in young women and uh, as well as men. We know you've spent uh, decades working on this and uh, we are happy to learn about new tools that are available to women, such as the long acting, slow release, ARVs, broadly uh, uh, neutralizing antibodies. We hope that is going to change the tide of, uh, 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 in terms of what is happening. We are also encouraged by the data that shows that there's minimal impact um, of COVID-19 on HIV and AIDS death. And, it's always good to have some good news and we hope it stays like that. You did mention that you are very early in the air. There isn't much that is known uh, at this stage about COVID-19. Thanks for sharing a range of um, initiatives and uh, for highlighting gender inequities. Thank you very much, Prof, for the thought-provoking uh, uh, presentation. Just as an issue of housekeeping again, the webinar is currently being broadcast live on YouTube and uh, you can follow us there if you, if you want or you want to look at it later. We will move on with the presentation and go on to our next speaker who is Professor Tumbindungu, uh, who will speak to us about the need for novel approaches to prevent HIV, to prevent and treat HIV infection and interactions of HIV-1 and SARS-CoV-2. Professor Ndungu is another one who needs no introduction. He is the Deputy Director of Science and the Max Planck Research Group Leader at the Africa Health Research Institute, ARI, which is one of our institutes at UKZN. He's a professor and Victor Dates Chain TB and HIV research at UKZN. He holds the South African Research Chain Systems Biology of HIV and AIDS. He's the professor of infectious diseases at University College London, as well as adjunct professor of immunology and infectious diseases at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. He's also the program director of the Sub-Saharan African Network for TB and HIV Research Excellence, Sandin. 
I will not go through the whole uh, uh, bio sketch. There is a lot that we can say about him, but uh, we will allow Prof to present. In the meantime, those who have questions, they can continue asking questions in the question and answer session. Uh, uh, um, you go to the button at the bottom of your screen and you put your question there. Thanks, Prof Makula. I see you've responded to a few questions, but at the end, we'll take all those questions where responses have not been given and will allow participants a chance to ask their questions. Thank you so much. Professor Tumbindungu, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Nkwama. I hope that uh, you can see my slides and that uh, you see the movie. Yes, we do. Thanks. All right, thank you. And uh, thanks again for the, to the organizers uh, of this uh, event for the opportunity to present here today. I'm just going to talk a little bit about uh, novel approaches to prevent and treat HIV infection, as well as uh, some work exploring uh, interactions between HIV and uh, SARS-CoV-2. I think everyone would uh, be familiar with uh, some of this data from UNAIDS uh, showing that uh, the rate of new HIV infections globally is going down, which is very good news. And I think that uh, it is, uh, you know, testament to a lot of the hard work that has been done by a lot of people, some of whom are in this, uh, in this webinar to prevent new HIV infections. But unfortunately, I think the new infections are not going down as fast as we would like. As you can see, we are missing the 2020 targets for reduction of new HIV infections uh, worldwide. And therefore HIV prevention remains a, a, a huge priority, uh, a scientific uh, challenge for all of us. And the other thing that I wanted to highlight is that even in uh, individuals who are on antiretroviral treatment, data shows that uh, these individuals are at higher risk of HIV-associated uh, morbidities, uh, including cardiovascular disease, metabolic disorders, neurocognitive abnormalities, malignancies, and so on. And so we still have high incidence and we don't have a vaccine available, and we have significant HIV-associated multimorbidity that we need to deal with as a community. Uh, that is globally, and I wanted to highlight some data from uh, some local studies. One is from a cohort-based uh, study that uh, we do here in Durban among young women between the ages of 2018 to 23, and you can see from this uh, statistics here, that of these young sexually active women that we have enrolled uh, since 2012, we have been able to identify 92 ac acute HIV infections and the HIV incidence in this cohort, although it is going down slightly, it still remains uh, around 7%, which is very high. Um, and if you, look at a population-based study that we have done in uh, rural KwaZulu-Natal, uh, led by Emily Wong at the Africa Health Research Institute, you can see the burden of HIV is huge, particularly in middle-aged uh, women and men, where, for example, in this age group between the ages of 25 and 44, HIV prevalence among women is about 60% in the Mkanyakunde district, whereas the uh, HIV prevalence among males is about 35, 36%. So we have a huge HIV burden. And even if we were able to stop new HIV infections, we have to still be concerned about the long-term impact of antiretroviral therapy in these individuals who have to be on uh, therapy for the rest of their lives. But also we have to be concerned about multimorbidity that may be associated with the long-term ART use and long-term HIV infection. Uh, and therefore we need to find new strategies to completely eliminate HIV if that's possible. So we know that HIV prevention is possible and is very effective and we have developed uh, a lot of tools now that are very effective at preventing HIV infection. 
chief among them is antiretroviral therapy. If people go on antiretroviral therapy, uh, you can significantly reduce HIV transmission. And there's a whole lot of others, uh, HIV education and counseling, medical meal circumcision, uh, safe sex practices, addressing poverty in women. All these are effective tools that can prevent HIV infection, but unfortunately they are not optimal. And sometimes we have difficulty uh, rolling out this and uh, getting acceptance of these uh, HIV prevention tools. So what are the next generation uh, tools? I listed pre-exposure prophylaxis on top of that list. And although it is currently available, so you could argue that it is not a next generation tool because it is currently available, but we know that uptake of pre-exposure prophylaxis, particularly in vulnerable groups, uh, especially young women is very low. And therefore I'm listing it under next generation tools. And I also think that the, lit the, uh, the latest uh, inventions, particularly to uh, of administering um, long-term pre-exposure prophylaxis that can be effective over three to six months is a really uh, fascinating and effective innovation that is likely to have big impact in terms of reducing new HIV infections. And then I wanted to highlight other new strategies such as passive immunization with broadly neutralizing uh, monoclonal antibodies, which uh, Professor Abdul Karim has also mentioned, vaccines, and possibly the modulation of the uh, vaginal microbiome. Obviously, we don't have this available, but uh, the particularly passive immunization and vaccines are currently in clinical trials, and we should uh, be hearing uh, some results soon, particularly for passive immunization to see whether broadly neutralizing monoclonal antibody can actually prevent new HIV infections. So this is exciting times. And depending on the way the results come out from these studies, uh, hopefully there will be much more progress in new tools to prevent uh, HIV infections. The other problem, of course, with HIV is that it persists over a long period of time in those that are HIV infected. So although antiretroviral therapy is very effective, it doesn't completely eliminate the virus. We all know that. And uh, I wanted to illustrate this with this uh, uh, data from a participant uh, enrolled in one of our studies. As you can see, was initiated there on treatment immediately after acute HIV infection and has almost undetectable or has had undetectable viral load throughout the period of monitoring, which extends beyond uh, into two years now and more than two years. But unfortunately, if you look at the lymph node uh, samples from this individual, you can still see that HIV persists within the lymph node uh, tissues and you can detect HIV uh, protein by P24 staining as shown there in green. And you can also detect RNA, HIV RNA, suggesting that there is ongoing virus Low, low level virus replication in this individual. So there is also a need not just um, to, pre to prevent new HIV infections, but to see whether we can actually cure uh, HIV infection. Uh, so how can we inform in the next generation of prevention and cure strategies? I, I wanted to uh, highlight one study that we have been doing here in Durban uh, it's an acute infection cohort uh, study. So what we do is that we follow individuals uh, uh, when they are HIV uninfected and we do regular testing by HIV RNA screening so that we can identify individuals as soon as they become HIV infected when they are on the uh, upward trajectory of viral load before they reach uh, peak viremia. So this is as early as you can detect acute HIV infection. And what we have done is then we immediately put these individuals on uh, antiretroviral treatment to suppress virus replication and to improve uh, immunological outcomes. And we have been able to use this cohort to study characteristics of the transmitted founder virus, which is a, a really important aspect of developing new prevention strategies because that's a virus that you would want to target in vaccines or other prevention strategies. 
We can also study immune responses in these uh, acutely infected individuals, and we can study the impact of viral antiretroviral therapy. And the ultimate goal of this work is to develop new uh, prevention and treatment strategies. So I wanted to use this uh, study to highlight uh, one of the biggest innovations in HIV in the HIV field over the last decade, which is the development of broadly neutralizing monoclonal antibodies, as uh, Professor Abdul Karimo, Karim also uh, mentioned. And uh, these are cartoons of these broadly neutralizing monoclonal antibodies attaching to the envelope Greco protein, which is the outer protein of HIV. And once they bind to the outer protein of HIV, they can completely block HIV infection. But what has also been shown about uh, broadly neutralizing monoclonal antibodies and which makes them even more exciting, potentially exciting, because obviously we need to do the studies to prove that they can work in people, is that not only can they block infection, but they may also actually be able to mediate long-term remission in some individuals, particularly in individuals who are HIV infected that started antiretroviral therapy early. So what we have done in, the, in this uh, acute HIV infection cohort that we call the the fresh cohort is to is to obtain virus isolates from these individuals during the earliest phases of infection, the so-called transmitted founder virus, and to test against a whole uh, bunch of broadly neutralizing monoclonal antibodies to see whether broadly neutralizing monoclonal antibodies can uh, can neutralize this virus. And I know that this uh, this is a busy slide, but uh, if you just bear with me for a minute, I can walk you through it. What we show here is that the one of the broadly neutralizing monoclonal antibodies called VRCO1 uh, that is highlighted there is not very good at blocking these uh, transmitted founder viruses uh, in our cohort. So generally the VRCO1, and this is the monoclonal antibody that is in clinical trials here in South Africa that we should be hearing the results uh, of the uh, AMP trial very soon now to hear whether this monoclonal antibody was effective in preventing new HIV infection. And, but when you test against other monoclonal antibodies, you can see that there are other monoclonal antibodies such as uh, CAP256 and uh, VRCO7 that are very, very potent, very, very effective against these transmitted founder viruses. And this kind of data is is very informative because it's going to tell us whether if the VRCO1 monoclonal antibody turns out to be effective, um, it is going to be very good news because it means that even a moderately active monoclonal antibody such as VRCO1 can prevent infections. And therefore, if we can improve on that monoclonal antibody and develop new monoclonal antibodies and more effective monoclonal antibodies such as VRCO7, and CAP-256, I think there's real hope that we might actually have a new tool to prevent new HIV infections, uh, both by passive immunization, but also potentially through immunization, if we can develop strategies uh, to develop new and novel immunogens. And as I said, not only are these uh, monoclonal antibodies effective in preventing infections, uh, potentially, but also they might be very effective in uh, treatment uh, strategies, particularly long-term in uh, treatment strategies that uh, aim to achieve long-term remission so that individuals who are HIV infected can live without having to take uh, daily antiretroviral therapy. So at the current stage, what we have is very, very effective combination antiretroviral therapy we are beginning to move into the phase of long-acting antiretroviral therapy and the carbotegravir uh, studies that have come out recently show that this is now a reality that we might have long-acting antiretrovirals in the future. Uh, hopefully we can also have broadly neutralizing monoclonal antibodies that uh, could also be used both for prevention and treatment. And in the future, there are obviously a lot of studies going on globally uh, to try and see whether we can develop cure modalities, uh, including gene therapy, but also immune-based cure strategies 
so that we can completely eliminate HIV or at least have long-term remission. So I think we have made a lot of progress uh, and uh, although we are still at least a decade away from a cure of HIV, we are beginning to see some really exciting uh, data that uh, suggests that this may be possible. And then very quickly, I wanted to just talk a little bit about uh, interactions of HIV and COVID-19. We know that the HIV infection may affect uh, long-term outcomes to various infections. We know that that is true, for example, with TB. And so the question is, how does HIV either treated and uh, controlled or uncontrolled HIV affect clinical outcomes following a SARS-CoV-2 infection? And does HIV affect immune responses to SARS-CoV-2? And what are the, the implications of this for clinical outcomes as, as well as for diagnosis, as well as long-term immunity? And so I just wanted to uh, highlight some data that is coming out of our, our laboratories here at the Africa Health Research Institute, where we have looked at antibody responses in HIV positive and HIV negative individuals. And as you can see in these graphs here, the good news seems to be that at least in the short term, when one looks at people who are recently uh, SARS-CoV-2 positive, there, is, there doesn't seem to be any difference in terms of the, either the kinetics or the development of antibodies or uh, even in terms of the titus of antibodies. So both of the kinetics of development as well as the amount, the highest amount of titus of antibodies that these individuals reach seem to be very comparable between HIV positive and HIV negative uh, individuals, which I think is good news both for diagnosis and surveillance, but also perhaps for immunity, because it tells us that uh, people who are HIV infected may also be able to mount very effective, uh, or at least effective as effective anti-SARS-CoV-2 um, uh, uh, antibodies as people who are HIV uninfected. So in summary, I think we have made tremendous progress in HIV prevention and treatment, but the current approaches uh, still uh, suffer from uh, some significant challenges and more needs to be done to optimize the current strategies because they are the ones we have and they are effective if they are used correctly. But we also need innovation in order to develop a next generation prevention and cure strategies that will be much more optimal than the current ones we have. And then uh, finally, I just wanted to say that uh, our preliminary data suggests that there are no differences between HIV positive and HIV negative individuals in terms of their uh, anti-SARS-CoV-2 short-term antibody kinetics. Of course, we don't know whether long-term in terms of the durability of these immune responses, whether there will be differences or not. So we don't know whether there are differences in terms of the functional uh, ability of these antibodies but the preliminary data at least is encouraging that there may not be uh, significant differences. And so I just wanted to uh, finish by thanking my colleagues uh, at uh, the Africa Health Research Institute, but also at UKZN, some of whom have participated in this work and also who have given me some ideas for this talk. Thank you. And thank you for uh, listening to me and for the opportunity to talk. Thank you very much, Professor Tsumbindungu, the, for going really into details about the studies that you guys have been conducting at ARI around these uh, uh, novel approaches to prevent and treat HIV infection. We really appreciate the work that you've done. We've heard about um, the vaccines, passive immunization, broadly neutralizing antibodies, like long acting ARTs, gene therapy, and a whole lot of information that makes us believe that the cure may be possible in the near future. Thank you very much, Prof, for sharing, uh, for giving us, us such an insightful uh, presentation. We will take questions at the end. Uh, so for now, we will move on to Mr. Nkazimulo Lula, who is a, a, a one of our students. And um, he will talk to us about personal experiences in relation to both HIV and COVID-19. Mr. Lula graduated in 2018 with a degree in BCom Supply Chain Management and Human Resources Management. She's currently completing, so sorry, it's a miss. Uh, I'm really sorry, it's not a mistake, it's a miss. She's currently completing her honors in Supply Chain Management at UKZN. 
She's a former peer educator and deputy president of the 2018 Westfield Campus Peer Educators Forum. She's an advocate for the success of youth, not only academically, but in all aspects of life. Her biggest passion and purpose in life is to help the youth reach their full potential and shape them into being the best human beings that they can be, despite the everyday challenges of life. Ms. Lula is currently serving her internship at Tumgeni Water Board. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Lula, for coming. Um, please go ahead. We are happy to host you. Please unmute. You are muted. Thank you very much, Chairperson. I hope I'm audible now. Yes, so sure, we can hear you now then. Thank you very much. Good evening to all our panelists. Good evening to all our UKZN staff. Good evening to all our stakeholders um, involved. My name is Umgazi Molo Shosha, um, and I am an activist, a student's activist for um, HIV. Um, I believe I wouldn't be doing much justice if I were to give a slide because it's a personal um, experience. It's more of a personal experience talk. So um, please bear with me. There won't be any slides. You'll just be seeing this beautiful face throughout um, the talk. Um, my journey with HIV started in late 2017, um, early 2018, where I was on campus and we were having one of those HIV AIDS um, campaigns under UCHASU, which is the campus um, HIV AIDS um, support unit for students. And um, somebody had suggested to us that as, as being part of CHASU, we should just get tested. So I went ahead, I got tested and the counselor said, no, I think, I, I think that you should go to um, the clinic and have another test because we're having an issue with our test. And my response was, are you really having an issue with those tests or you just don't want to show me my results? So the following day I went to the clinic and um, I got tested. Um, lucky enough, it was the blood tests that they were running that day. They weren't just doing the, the normal finger prick tests. Um, moving on to 2018, because um, it was in the festive season that I had gotten tested. Moving on to 2018, that's when I discovered that, boom, biggest surprise of my life, um, I was diagnosed with HIV. Now, what made it easier for me, and it didn't come as much of a shock in the sense that I was already, in my family, there were people who were already diagnosed with HIV. So people around me had already experienced and I had seen them experience and go through HIV, um, living with HIV. So it made it made that burden lighter for me because my thing was if I could see people that I'm close to living with HIV and living this life positively and still carrying on to, to, to being the people that they are meant to be reaching their full destiny and their full potential, what is going to stop me? And I was so thankful at the time because I had a very great support system. Um, all the people that I was working around at CHAS who were such, provided such a great support system for me. So it made me um, overcome that, that it, it made me overcome that fear. Um, and I was at a level where I was able to disclose from the get-go. Um, there weren't any issues of what are people going to say? What are people going to think? There wasn't that stigma at the back of my mind that, oh my word, people are going to think that now I'm different. Now I'm living with this. Now people are going to view me in such a negative way. It, it, it wasn't at all like that for me. The burden had been lifted off my shoulders um, due to the support system that I had. And thank God for that support system up until today. Um, so it made it easy for me to inspire others. It made it easy for, easier for me to share my journey and my experience with others as well that were um, diagnosed and living with HIV. Now, my biggest challenge for me came um, during this year when I was also diagnosed with COVID-19. Um, and in me being diagnosed, my, diagn my results, my test results came two days after um, my father had just passed away. Um, so I was dealing with the passing of my father and now I'm dealing with the fact that now I'm now also 
uh, I have now also been diagnosed with COVID-19 and having a background of cardiac arrhythmia. Um, the mental games that were playing in my head, my cardiac arrhythmia is now going to resurface. Um, the HIV is now going to resurface. It's COVID-19. I've heard and seen people suffer from COVID-19. I know a few people that didn't make it, unfortunately, and um, succumb to coronavirus. Now those mind games keep kept on playing in my head as I'm, I'm, I'm going to lose my life. Um, I'm not going to be able to make it out of this one. Um, but thank God, um, again, I had such a great support system and the people around me were able to support me because I was able, even though I was going through that difficult time, I was able to um, let my family know that this is the case. I was diagnosed with COVID and I'd recently been to the hospital um, for a checkup. Um, and I'd spent quite a lot of time there because during this whole time, I was cautious and careful. So uh, make, ensuring that I'm not in any surrounding where there are a lot of people around. So um, unfortunately I had to go to the hospital and um, that was the only time I could think of that. I that uh, That was the only place where I could think of that I had contracted. Um, the coronavirus. So lucky enough, I had my family to support me. They were understanding. Um, they were open to quarantining with me. We were all quarantining at home um, in our different rooms. And the support that I got um, from my colleagues as well, from everybody around me, from my family, from my colleagues, from my friends was tremendous. And it made me realize and it made me fight um, to get through this, uh, to get through COVID-19, because for me, initially when I was diagnosed, the mental game that was playing was, I'm not gonna make it. I had already given up before I'd even started the fight. But after I had received such support and having people believe in me and having people saying that we are with you all the way and we're fighting this with you, that made me overcome even the mental aspect that was attached to it more so than ever. Um, I think the mental aspect attached to COVID-19 is actually the killer because you get depressed, you get so many thoughts, you go through so so many emotions you go through so many feelings and you start bringing up and digging up your your past um, illnesses I started digging up and bringing up my past illnesses my cardiac arrhythmia the HIV and all of that and um, it, it, it was very difficult to overcome that that mental hold that it has on you um, so I'm so grateful for um, that support and getting through this made me realize that Support is very important. Um, nothing hurts me more than when I walk into a hospital, walk into a clinic or walk into a treatment facility and the people who are supposed to be helping us. Somebody had mentioned this um, before. I think it was Professor Umakula had mentioned this, that this, th there's still that stigma around people with HIV. There's still that stigma around people um, that are uh, have tested positive for corona or had been diagnosed previously in the past with corona, even from the health workers. Um, so I think that for me personally, my belief is that the elimination of the stigmatization around HIV AIDS, around um, COVID-19, around any pandemic will ensure that we um, are able to fight off the pandemic, will ensure that we're able to fight off that disease. Um, I wouldn't have gotten to this level of confidence that I have today where I can sit in front of people and disclose and talk about my past experiences in relation with HIV, in relation with COVID-19, if I hadn't had a great support system, if I hadn't had people who believed in me, um, if I hadn't uh, had people who guided me, who mentored me and directed me into the right path and who actually helped me believe more in myself more now so than ever so um it wasn't easy um i don't want to lie um the COVID 19 especially it wasn't easy because it's something that hit really hard um it's something that came at a time where i was already dealing with a lot and having to make a decision of whether or not do you go to your father's funeral or do you not go to your father's funeral um because that's there's still that fear of i don't want to 
infect people, the people around me. But thankfully enough, my family had made arrangements. Um, so I was I, I was able to isolate at the funeral as well. And I didn't spend much hours at the funeral because the amount of time that I spent was only 30, um, 30 minutes. So um, I was thankful for that in that aspect. Um, the fight against COVID, the fight against HIV and AIDS, it doesn't fall only on the people that are infected and affected. It doesn't only fall on the people that are infected by these diseases or by these viruses. It also falls on the people that are, are, are around us. Um, I remember once I was doing a talk with some students and when I disclosed my HIV status, one of them said to me, you don't look like you have HIV. And my response was, you never know if somebody has HIV. So the onus is on me as a person who is infected to disclose my status, but the onus is also on you to take care of yourself. Because like you said, it's not written on my forehead that, oh, she has HIV AIDS or, oh, she has COVID-19. So it's up to you to take care of yourself. You can't compromise your health and put your health in, in the trust of other people, in the hands of other people. You need to take care of yourself and in taking care of yourself, you protect others as well. So it's not just something that infected the people that are infected go through and have to, um, it, it has to be a burden to them or a responsibility to them, but it's a responsibility for all those around us. For me as an infected person, it's my responsibility because I don't want to infect other people. And for you as an uninfected person, it's your responsibility to not get infected. Um, so with that being said, and in closing, um, I'd like to thank, uh, thank you very much for this opportunity to share my personal experience with HIV and COVID-19. I won't take up any more of your time because I can see that we are fighting against time. Um, but through it all, support is very important. Um, dealing with the mental issues or the mental challenges that come about from diseases such as HIV and COVID-19. Um, if we can deal with those, we've already won half the battle. And in closing, I'd like to say um, thank you very much for this opportunity. My name is Ungazi Mulozhuta. I am HIV positive and I'm a COVID-19 survivor. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Gazimulo. Thanks so much, Ms. Gazimulo. Uh, it was really uh, heartening to listen to your journey. Uh, you've shared with us some I mean, deep personal experiences and we are really grateful for that. And uh, I know you've shared them so that other people can benefit. And it's good to know that you had the support that made uh, overcoming it easy. You've highlighted the issues of stigma, which you say even came from health workers. And these are all the issues that we need to reflect upon as we move forward. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, I would like to apologize. We are running behind schedule a little bit, but I hope we can catch up soon. Uh, we would like to call upon our next speaker, Mr. Siabonga Moses Ngambako, who will give the message on behalf of students of UKZN. He is the SRC president, Siabonga Moses Gambako is the student representative, council central executive president, as well as the convener of the SASCO Westfield branch. He served as a former Westfield SRC chairperson, peer educator, chairperson of CHASU, and the former residence joint chairperson committee treasurer. He's a final year student in the discipline of biokinetics, exercise and leisure sciences, hoping to qualify as a biokinetist. You will qualify. Uh, it's not just a hope. We are very uh, happy to see some of our students in the college taking up these leadership positions uh, in the university. Uh, over to you uh, and Mr. Ngambako. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Chair, for the opportunity that has been afforded to me. Uh, one must begin by uh, extending his revolutionary greetings to the Council of the Institution, the Executive Management Committee led by the Vice Chancellor and Principal Prof. Nanapoko, uh, to the DVC of Health Sciences, Prof. Busisiwe Ngama, uh, to Ms. Noma Zondo, uh, in charge of the Corporate Relations, 
uh, to Prof Nombulelo Mabula, to Prof Mkize, uh, to the student representative councils that are situated in their different campuses, and all the panelists in their respective positions and roles that they've played uh, in this lecture. Lastly, I would like to humbly treat uh, the larger stakeholder of the institution, which is our student populace, in their different campuses and residence spaces. Firstly, one must begin by showing gratitude to the College of Health Science, working together with the corporate relations and other involved stakeholders for this very powerful and informative lecture that we have been invited to. It was indeed, uh, uh, it was indeed needed as we have gained more information on HIV and AIDS and the impact that COVID-19 has had in our students and the society at large. We are really grateful for the information provided to us from the different panelists that are invited and that have all the stats and the facts revolving around HIV and AIDS and COVID-19. Uh, I would like to speak a little bit on World AIDS Day to our students. World AIDS Day is a very important day in our calendar year, which must be celebrated every year as it affords us an opportunity to show solidarity towards people who are living with HIV and AIDS. It reminds us about the importance of uniting and fighting against HIV and AIDS worldwide. It also gives us an opportunity to remember those that we have lost because of HIV and AIDS and also gives us and also gives hopes to those that have been living with HIV and AIDS since the day of birth and those people who have contracted the disease along the way of life. It further educates us more uh, on HIV and AIDS and how it can be halted or rather prevented in all our academic spaces. As the UKZN student leadership, we are making it a point that we encourage our students to turn every day into a World's Aid Day by knowing the APCs, which are to abstain, be faithful, and to condomize. We encourage our students to know their statuses by going to the campus clinics that are situated in all campuses for HIV tests. We further encourage our students to join the peer education program by CHASU, which educates our student populace on the importance of knowing their statuses. It educates our students on how, on knowing how to deal with the different challenges that are affecting our everyday lives as students, as students in our campuses. Peer education, it nurtures a students into knowing the roles that they must play when it comes to supporting people that are living with HIV and AIDS or any other related diseases that have to do with the impacts that they have in their health. So we encourage our students to kindly please go to the clinics and seek information on peer education and further join peer education as it will contribute tremendously in our campuses. We best believe that by working together as different stakeholders of the institution, from council, university management, student leadership, convocation, the UKZN alumni, club and societies, and even our students, we can be able to beat HIV and AIDS within our campuses and going out to the society. We have the capacity, we have the power, and now let's utilize it to fight the well-known enemy, which is HIV and AIDS. As the SRC in UKZN, we commit ourselves into fighting HIV and AIDS in our respective campuses. We further call on our students and all the stakeholders to join hands and create programs that will seek to assist in fighting and raising awareness on HIV and AIDS worldwide every day. Through the SRC offices of our student support services officer for all five campuses, it including to the SRC executive of our student support services, our doors are open for all stakeholders to join hands with us, to join hands with us and fight HIV and AIDS. We best believe and we best know that if we could work together, we can beat the transmission of HIV and AIDS and move in one single voice and knowledge so that we can pass to generations and generations to come. We are capable and the power is in our hands, all of us as the stakeholders of the institution at large. And to our previous speaker, Ms. Nkazumulo Lula, we have gained so much confidence in you and we have now understood how important support is. And I best believe that even our students have learned a lot from you and majority of them will come forward and join our PA education since you are the product of the UK's NPA education. It also shows with the amount of confidence that you have 
and how you have been supported going throughout and have remained strong that you are part and parcel of you are part and parcel in the products of our peer education that we have within our institution. With that being said, thank you very much to the College of Health Science, to the stakeholders that were involved, to corporate relations for affording us this opportunity and further affording our students an opportunity to be lectured uh, on this very important topic, which is HIV and AIDS and the impact of COVID-19. We thank you very much and we hope that programs of this nature will carry on to inspire us as a student leadership, inspire our students and further inspire the UK and community at large. Thank you very much, Chair. Of, of the session. I thank you. Thank you very much, uh, 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 Chair, uh, I mean, um, uh, 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 President. I sometimes confuse this chairperson and president, but you are the president of the SRC. Thank you so much. And thanks for the uh, uh, remarks. And we hope the students will hit your call. Uh, we would like now to open these presentations up for, for questions. We know that a few questions have been answered and maybe if you, uh, though for those questions that have not been answered, we'll take a few hands and uh, I'll start off maybe with the questions that are already appearing in the question and answer session, which remains unanswered. And uh, Marianne, if you can note hands while I read the questions. So I'll look at those that uh, remain unanswered. Uh, there's one saying, thank you, Prof. Uh, thanks uh, from uh, Hussein. Thank you, Prof. Abdul Karim from Kadima. I would like to know if there are factors that contribute to the high rate of HIV infection among women in KZN, either in rural or, bed or urban areas, and what can explain this among female gender than male? Thank you. And uh, then I think the other one is also addressed to Prof. Abdul, uh, uh, Prof. Kuresha. Thank you, Prof. Next question, are there laws in South Africa that protect the confidentiality and human rights of people living with HIV? Then Maya Bonga Zulu says, in addition to the above question, can one access or view those laws? Maybe if we can take those questions, Prof. Uh, Abdul uh, uh, Karim, and then we'll move to the other questions. Thanks uh, very much, Prof. Kama, and for the participants who asked these questions and for their positive comments. So just on the question of what factors contribute to the increased risk in young women. So there are both um, behavioral and biological factors contributing. Behavior I highlighted, uh, which is the age, sex, uh, difference and uh, where young women are having sex with men who are eight or more years older than them and that's really the source of infection. But the other sort of behaviors that uh, enhance HIV acquisition uh, relates to gentle health and the biological factors um, and again behavioral factors. So the what we've learned over the past five or six years is the importance of gentle health. And particularly where women have gentle inflammation or alteration of the gentle tract, what we see is um, about a two to three fold increased risk of HIV acquisition. We don't understand why, uh, for example, the pH declines, but when it, um, or, or increases rather, and when it does, um, usual um, bacteria that live happily alongside with everything else um, become more pathogenic. And there's a whole series of things that happen that contribute to uh, this enhanced risk. And one of the factors we found, for example, is um, HPV infection. So if you have HPV infection, um, human papilloma virus, we know it causes cervical cancer, but also in the presence of HPV infection, you see enhanced HIV acquisition. There could be other factors that are contributing, for example, intravaginal substance use patterns, etc. But I think fundamentally what we're talking about is what are acceptable gender norms and behaviors in society? 
And uh, so this is very much a social challenge that we need to face that has at it, as its root cause gender power disparities. So I can talk to you about behavior and uh, women's behavior and what they can do and they can't and should or shouldn't. And I can talk to you about biology. But as long as we have toxic masculine identity and we have certain um, uh, sort of expectations on how women should and be behave and can be treated, uh, then we're going to continue to see the spread of um, HIV. And HIV, as I mentioned in my talk, is but one of many challenges facing women. In fact, uh, one of the biggest causes of death in, uh, in young women is um, a a teenage pregnancies. Uh, contributing to about 40% of deaths in young women and about half of all deaths that we see in terms of maternal mortality rates. Um, Gender-based violence, we heard earlier today from the SAMRC RISE study that those women who um, have experienced rape and use some of the rape survivor centers um, can have up to 7% um, new infections post uh, surviving uh, their, uh, surviving rape uh, compared to women in the population um, of uh, clinic users who they compare this to, where we're seeing about 5% uh, incident infections. So in other words, um, we have high HIV infection rates in young women, five out of 100 per year getting infected if you take a cohort of that size compared to those who have also experienced gender-based violence and particularly um, uh, sexual abuse uh, where the, um, the rates are about 40% higher than uh, women in the general population. So I'm just gonna stop there because the, you got me on my favorite topic and I could spend <laughs> many hours on it. Um, and then just in terms of laws, and I think one, we have a constitution that's unparalleled in terms of gender equity. And we also have a set of laws uh, that uh, could enforce these. But we know there's a bit of disconnect between legislation and our ability to implement that or recognition of rights that people have. So there's a lot of work here that we can do as part of advocacy efforts to ensure that more of us know what our rights are, what our responsibilities are as well, because with freedoms come responsibilities. And I think at the end of the day, the university um, environment is the right place to start changing some of these uh, toxic uh, masculinities and, 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 and norms that are actually curtailing uh, young people's ability to reach their full potential. And I just want to say one last thing, which is in Africa, another unique characteristic is that 65% of its population is under the age of 35. And so if we start losing young women to HIV and we start losing young men to substance use, we're actually de de decimating an important dem demographic dividend that we have on the continent, including in the province and in the country. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Prof. Abdullah Karim, for the responses. Highly appreciated. Uh, the, the others that have noted are mainly people who are thanking uh, uh, presenters for the wonderful presentation, but I've noted one to uh, uh, about two questions. One is from um, Kwanaziti to Ngazimulo. Once again, thank you, Ngazimulo. How do you relate to a close partner who has known your HIV status for years, but who regularly seem to dig it up and remind you of it all the time when there's a disagreement in your relationship? I think that's all the other people are just thanking you, Gasimulo, and um, there's probably one which is also addressed to both you and Prof. Mkise. To your knowledge, do we still have these extreme forms of stigma in RSA where people would be ostracized by family members or community to the extent that they are banished from home or community just because they have HIV? I was surprised to come across such a case three years ago, and I wondered if it's still common. If Gazimulo uh, can just talk to that, and then afterwards, if Prof. Mkiza can add, 
that's the last round of questions we'll take. Thereafter, we'll allow maybe the two other speakers, uh, Prof. Uh, 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 Magula. See, she has answered most of the questions in the chat. If she has any parting shots, and then also um, Prof. Tumbindu. Thank you. Thank you, Chairperson. Um, to Umkwanazi too, um, once again, Kazimuna, thank you for your uh, thank you. How do you relate to a close partner who has known your HIV status for years, but who regularly seems to pick it up and remind you of it all the time when you have a disagreement in your relationship? Now, the hardest part about being um, infected or living with HIV is when people keep bringing up, especially if you had gone to them in confidence and you had told them your status uh, with the hopes that you're um, bringing about this culture of openness within the relationship and when there seems to be an argument all the time it keeps um, being brought up. Now it's challenging in a sense that it makes you want, not want to um, reveal your HIV status and number two it also reveals that um, although the person may have said that they accept you for who you are they still haven't accepted what you're living with, the HIV, they still haven't accepted that part. And in some aspects, it becomes a toxic, toxic relationship because I had someone who I was counseling and they were in the same situation. They were dealing with the, the um, she was dealing with a situation where her partner knew that she was HIV positive, but he, she, he kept on bringing it up every time they had a fight or every time they had an argument or every time they didn't see eye to eye. And it got to a level where it was, for her, it was toxic and she had to leave. So I think the best part would be, the best suggestion would be if um, anybody is in, in that type of situation, I think communicate with the person, um, tell them how you're feeling about it. And if it continues, you're better off without it. The fact that you're living with HIV doesn't mean um, that you should be made to be, you should be belittled or made to feel inferior because of what runs through your veins. Um, I hope that addresses your question. Um, secondly, um, there are still instances where people are still stigmatized and they are disowned. Some of my family members disowned me. Um, they don't even talk to me up until today um, because of my diagnosis. Um, they don't even drink from the same cup or, or eat from the same plate or even um, want to be around the same space as me because of, 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 of my diagnosis. It's some of the things that we have to deal with, unfortunately. Um, it's some of the things that your, your your mental state of mind and your, your 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 mental state of mind, your belief in yourself, your confidence in yourself needs to be an inch higher above the rest for you not to let it get to you. Um, I always say to people, what I have, my HIV, um, my COVID nineteen diagnosis, doesn't define me because I'm already well defined. Um, so I'll hand over to Prof Mkiza. I hope that answers um, your question. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Thank you. Thanks so much, Gazi. Uh, Prof Mkiza. Thank, thank you very much, uh, uh, Gazi Mulo, for a, an excellent testimony. I want to echo the thanks and appreciation of many of uh, our attendees. Uh, your bravery is a lesson to all of us. Now, going back to uh, Ms. Nobo uh, and uh, the issue of stigmatization, I, I think we need to understand that uh, the stigmatization is hidden because the visibility of HIV AIDS is no longer in your face as it used to be in the past. With the uh, advance in art and other forms of treatment, the visibility has been uh, removed from our faces and it's no longer something that we deliberate about on a day-to-day -day basis. But at a very, very deep level, and in some cases and communities, I would think that stigmatization is still there and it may also be associated with some underlying themes or unresolved issues in relation to HIV in that particular context. And since we may not want to speak about those issues, the best uh, psychological response therefore would be to blame the one who is coming forward. But I do agree it's some area that we need to continue to, to research and get 
hard data in relation to it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Prof. Nkuse. Thanks so much. Uh, I would like to hand over to Prof. Makula just for a parting shot because she has answered most of the questions uh, in the chat. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Nkuse. So my parting shot is uh, going to be that I think we've heard from all the presentations uh, this evening that a lot of these problems that you are talking about are happening at community level and that our responses then have to be focused at community level that we take uh, all the expertise that exists in academic corridors and transfer that and have interventions uh, thought of and developed to address all of these societal ills uh, that once we've addressed uh, then hopefully we will find a society that is healthy, um, that will have extended life expectancy free of the suffering that people are going through. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. Makula. And uh, uh, Prof. Tumbindongu, anything? I also know, know that you've answered most of your questions. Uh, if there's any parting shots and uh, yeah. Thanks uh, very much, uh, Prof. And um, I think it's just to, to say that uh, we, we need to do the, uh, the, the very best that we can with the current uh, tools that we have to prevent new HIV infections and of course to treat HIV infection. But uh, I also just wanted to say, particularly for the sake of the young people that are in this, in the audience that uh, there is a lot of room for innovation and for thinking of outside the box for new strategies to, to, that can work against HIV. And we need to be thinking about those as well so that we can innovate, uh, so that we can defeat uh, HIV, HIV AIDS. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think we're now at a stage where we would like to light a candle and commemorate uh, all those that have departed. And I would like to ask Noma, uh, Ms. Noma Zondo, our executive director uh, acting for corporate relations to lead us in that uh, ceremony. So if all the colleagues who've got candles with them can stand up and light them up, but uh, Noma will then take us through what to do. Okay, uh, thank you uh, so much, uh, Chairperson. Uh, good evening, colleagues. I know we started, it was still uh, uh, sunlight, but uh, it's all dark now. So I hope you enjoyed the webinar. Uh, colleagues, uh, student leadership and all participants, I, I have been given a task uh, to uh, lead the, the candle lighting ceremony. Um, this usually have uh, uh, some objectives to it. Uh, with almost 38 million people living with HIV and AIDS today, uh, the candlelight ceremony serves as an important uh, intervention for global solidarity, uh, breaking down barriers of stigma and discrimination. Uh, it is time for all of us uh, to remember the many lives um, uh, lost to HIV and AIDS. Uh, it is also an opportunity to honor those who have uh, to honor those who have dedicated their lives in helping people living with HIV and AIDS, and those who are affected by HIV, and continue to mobilize our community in solidarity. As the world deals with a coronavirus uh, pandemic, we must support our families and communities to stay healthy. Uh, COVID-19 has, uh, has made it difficult for us to have traditional public gatherings, but I mean, today we're gathered here online as we remember those uh, we have lost. Uh, let us uh, take actions uh, that are safe and so that we can um, live beyond COVID-19 and HIV. Um, I'm now uh, going to request all our, our panelists uh, to light their candles and hold it up uh, to the screen so that we can see it. Unfortunately, uh, we can't see everyone, but uh, at least you can see the panelists. You can join us at home if you want to. Um, I would like to start with uh, Professor Ngama. 
Is your candle on? Yes, my candle. Yes, okay. Uh, uh, Professor Mkise, I hope you have your candle. I can't see everyone. Uh, Professor Masibuko, Professor Moshabela. Uh, our president, Kambako, Professor Makula, Professor Abdul Karim, and Professor Dungu, uh, Ms. Ramapodi, uh, Ms. Daza, and Ms. Langley. Are you all on the screen? Okay, I also have a candle. So colleagues, uh, let's uh, let's raise our let's raise our our candles uh, to honor the memories of uh, those lost to HIV and AIDS, to show support to those living with HIV and AIDS, to uh, to raise uh, community awareness and uh, decrease uh, stigma related to HIV and AIDS and to mobilize our community involvement in the fight against HIV and AIDS. Finally, uh, let us uh, come together to raise awareness, support, and remember those affected by HIV and AIDS, and to show a global solidarity in the fight against the disease. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you very much, Norma. We really appreciate uh, you having led this uh, um, candle lighting ceremony. And uh, with, because we are now running out of time, we will now hand over to Ms. Busi Ramabotu to uh, um, do a vote of thanks for us. Um, thank you so much, uh, Professor Nama, and uh, good evening to all the colleagues and all the stakeholders that are represented here tonight. Um, please join me um, in thanking uh, the colleagues for the successful engagement that we've had. Uh, first and foremost, uh, thank you to um, uh, Professor Mushabela for opening and uh, giving us a word of encouragement. Um, we do know that HIV is a, a condition that is manageable, but we do know also that COVID-19 has compounded uh, uh, um, HIV. But uh, I'm leaving tonight with hope um, that once again, UKZN scientists and medical practitioners who were leading in the fight against HIV continue to lead um, in the fight against COVID-19. It's been an insightful uh, evening uh, in terms of the research that is being done that the panelists have shared. So to all the panelists that um, are presented tonight, thank you so much for the work that you continue to do. Um, and thank you for sharing the work with us uh, tonight and giving us hope. Um, and to um, uh, our students and our speaker, Ms. Um, Lula, thank you so much for sharing your inspiring story. And please continue to shine. Um, the youth of South Africa uh, need people like you. So please do continue to shine. Um, you have our support at UKZN. Um, and Thank you to all the guests that have come out tonight. We know that you are very busy, but uh, um, your coming out tonight reminds us that once again, we must not be complacent uh, when it comes to HIV and AIDS because we are still seeing new infections and we still don't have a cure. So for as long as that remains, the work continues. So thank you for coming out tonight and just, um, to be reminded that we still need to continue in the fight. Um, and thank you to Mary and Francis um, for organizing the event um, and all, all the corporate relations colleagues that helped in, 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 in organizing the event. Um, to the ICS team, I know they're usually behind the scenes supporting us in terms of technical support. Um, and um, last but not least, Thank you to Professor um, Nama for hosting the session. Um, 
and for facilitating uh, tonight's session. And to our Executive Director, Corporate Relations, uh, Ms. Norma Zondo, thank you for facilitating the session again um, in commemorating uh, people that are living with HIV and the people that have passed on in a candle lighting ceremony. So it is very clear that uh, we do have a twin pan pandemic, but from tonight, it's clear that together we will win the fight against this pandemic. So thank you so much and do enjoy your evening further. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Ramabotu, and thank you to all participants we've run behind, I mean, behind schedule, and thanks for bearing with us. I would like to, uh, to hand over now to Professor Mosa Moshabela to do the closing. Thank you so much, uh, DVC. I, I was going to basically give you a list of the key messages that uh, I've been synthesizing as I'm listening to the, to the presentations and the discussions. And uh, I will do that and I will share them with the, with the DVC uh, afterwards. And uh, so that these messages can be, can be taken to, to, to the executive uh, when she reports back on this event. Uh, but I just want to highlight a couple of things that really stood out for me. It's so wonderful for me to see uh, students and academics and uh, support staff talking together and thinking together. I, I feel like we are creating a model here for how we should be taking the challenges that we are facing forward. And I would really like to, 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 to encourage that we take this as, as a lesson. And for me, I was sitting here thinking, but why are we not doing this all the time? Because then there's so many ideas just, um, you know, and messages that, that are coming through and listening to our students as well, the passion that, that is coming through. I would really like to, to suggest DVC that we take, we take note of, um, of, of this sort of uh, uh, arrangement. But I, I must say that I, I would like to single out the, the issue of uh, stigma and mental health as a cross-cutting issue that was really discussed today. And I, I, I would like to request that the, the university makes a commitment to, to, to addressing this matter. Uh, Professor uh, Tumbindung, we've noted that PrEP is available as an innovation, but it is not being taken up. And, and I, I have noted that uh, it is something that uh, even Professor Kiresha Abdulkarim has raised several times with us, she has even donated to the university to basically make sure that there can be increased uptake of, uh, uh, of PrEP. And I, I think also this is something that is really important to, to, to mention. We have also noted the burden on, on women and all the intersectionality of the different issues that affect women that make it difficult for, 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 for women to, to succeed in their efforts and the fight uh, against HIV and the importance of making sure that men become part of that solution. And I would also like to, to highlight that. And, and for me, I think that uh, from Ms. Lutla, I've really heard you in terms of the importance of social support. And we also need to think about how social support is not something that you only get from your family, but we can create an environment in the university to support that. There's, there's a number of key messages, but those are the ones that I, I just wanted to highlight, given the, the, the shortage of time, to, to just say that we've been listening and, and we've been hearing what you're saying, and we'll try to convey these messages to, to, to the university. Thank you, Professor Ngam. Thank you very much, Professor Mashabel. I like your suggestion that you will write it up and I will present it at EMC, because such discussions should not end up here but the highest level of the university, which is the executive management, should drive them going forward. Thank you very much to uh, everybody that attended, all our panelists, and uh, goodbye and God bless. Thanks.